We are live. Live. Okay. Um, hello, friends. Uh, I think it gives me great pleasure as the incoming president of the Indian Arthroscopy Society. Uh, to invite you and welcome you to this first webinar. I think this is one of the first for us uh, since uh, it was uh, very recently till we formed the Indian Women in Arthroscopy meeting. And um, this is the first educational venture or this first event of uh, our uh, Indian Women in Arthroscopy. I hope that uh, this particular section of our committee of our Indian Arthroscopy Society will grow in years to come because I think now um, it's important that we have uh, good representation and uh, it's very encouraging to see a lot of women take up arthroscopy as uh, you know their first choice and orthopedics as their first choice. So I'm going to ask uh, my colleague Neha. Neha is uh, a young and bright and uh, very enthusiastic surgeon from uh, Nagpur and uh, Neha will welcome us and just give us the first brief on what this webinar is all about and what she has planned for the next couple of months to come. Neha, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Sachin, sir. Uh, so uh, welcome, I welcome you all for the first webinar of IAS and EVA. Uh, EVA is Indian Women in Arthroscopy and the first webinar will be of uh, basic knee arthroscopy which consists of uh, basic uh, examination of the knee radiological findings, how to start up the knee arthroscopy for the beginners. And then our uh, president, Dr. Sachin Tapas, will, will be speaking on saving the meniscus. And uh, Dr. Laurie will be speaking on the graft choice and decision making on of ACL. So today, uh, we are lucky to have two presidents as faculty. So our first faculty is uh, Dr. Laurie Hymistra. She is currently serving as a president of prestigious Canadian Orthopedic so Association. She is the orthopedic surgeon at Balm Sport Medi Medicine and clinical associate professor at University of Calgary, Department of Surgery. She is a director of research at Balm Sports Medicine Foundation and has a tremendous work on sports injury and specifically patella instability. Our uh, another guest, not, not guest, actually host faculty, I would say, is a president of Indian Arthroscopy Society. He is a chair of knee sports and preservation at ISACOS, an avid academician and a wonderful surgeon and mentor to many arthroscopy surgeons like us, uh, is Dr. Sachin Tapasli. We have uh, Dr. Anupama Patil, a charming and ever smiling radiologist from Pune, Maharashtra. She specializes in sports injuries, muscular skeletal imaging. Currently, she is a director and chief of radiology at Star Imaging Center, Pune. My friend, my colleague, Dr. Pratima Khincha, she has done her proposed graduation from BMCRI, then acquired her MCH and FRCS degree from the UK. Also has done arthroscopy fellowships from various parts of UK and India. And currently, she is working as consultant orthopedic surgeon at Kincha Orthopedic Center. So I welcome you all, and we look forward to uh, brainstorming sessions of uh, knee arthroscopy. Thank you, Neha. And uh, we'll get on with the scientific program. And um, of course, a warm welcome to Laurie. I think when she comes to her talk, I'd like to speak more about her. But um, I think uh, Pratima, uh, the screen is all yours to share for the next uh, 10 minutes. And uh, please give us your view on the current topic that you wish to discuss today. Thank you all for your very kind words. Uh, thank you to the IAS and specifically the Indian Women in Arthroscopy Wing for this wonderful opportunity today. So I'll be speaking about the examination of the knee uh, from an arthroscopist point of view. So it's not uncommon that we get patients coming to the clinic with images saying, you know, doctor, I have an ACL tear. And, uh, you know, it's very tempting to look at the MRI images, but it's very important that we take a detailed history to determine what the actual problem is, the duration of the problem, and localize the pain and dysfunction so that we can focus our clinical examination 
to then diagnose with this this is an articular injury whether this is an instability of the knee or is it related to the patellofemoral joint or a combination of these so coming to the history pain is a very important factor determine whether the pain is actually coming from the knee or maybe is it referred from elsewhere and also when the pain occurs is it on certain activities is it on weight bearing swelling clicking locking are mechanical symptoms that are often uh, described by the patients and when it comes to locking we usually ask the patients to describe what they mean by locking because often they assume that not being able to bend the knee is locking however true locking is the exact opposite when they're not able to extend the knee from a flex position uh, the same goes for giving way as well so occasional giving way in straight line activities can be due to the inhibition of quadriceps so to differentiate this pseudo instability from a true instability where which is more on rotatory or twisting movements of the knee so if they've had an injury it's often good to ask the patients to replicate the mechanism of the injury what exactly happened if they were playing were they able to continue playing or was it game over what treatment did they receive and the most important factor in the opd is to determine why the patient is there what is their expectation what do they want from this consult do they want to go back to playing and all these questions then answer what treatment we need to be giving to our patient so before a specific clinical examination of the knee it's good to check the bitten score for hyperlaxity uh, to check the gait if they are weight bearing as well as any deformity of the lower limb so coming to meniscal injuries effusion usually comes about a few hours after an injury or even the following day and tenderness along this joint line is quite sensitive for a meniscal injury so usually just these tests and the history is indicative of a meniscal injury sometimes we can do a mcmurray test as well but very importantly it's it, we should check the range of movement to make sure that there is a complete extension possible because if the inability to do that could indicate a buckle handle tear of the medial meniscus which should not be missed in an acute case so coming to the mcmurray test so i remember it as merlin so medial is external rotation lateral meniscus is internal rotation so keeping the knee in a flex position you either internal or externally rotated and if there is pain on extending the knee the test is usually positive so for anyone who wants to read further tests about the meniscus this is a really good paper but often on an outpatient basis these tests are suffice to pick up a meniscal injury so coming to knee instability it's important to check whether there is any deformity because this helps us in our surgical planning especially if we are doing any ligament reconstruction effusion is unlikely in an isolated mcl or an lcl injury our tenderness is important so it's good to find your own method of palpation around the knee to make sure we are not missing any important structures and then there are special tests to check for an mcl lcl acl pcl or posterolateral posteromedial corner injury so coming to the valgus and varus stress test for the mcl and uh, lcl respectively it's important to do this in 30 degree flexion to pick up isolated mcl and lcl injuries as shown and the important thing in this is just not the joint opening but to also determine the end point of uh, while doing the test so whether it's a hard end point or a soft end point and the same goes for the lachman test as well so this is ideal for an acl injury which is done in 30 degrees of flexion and you have anterior translation of the tibia again to determine whether this is a hard end point or a soft end point and in some cases where you know there's a very bulky quadriceps another way of doing this test is with the patient's permission keep your own thigh under the patient get it to 30 degrees of flexion stabilize the leg and then check for anterior translation of the tibia so this is quite helpful in the outpatient so coming to the drawer test both the anterior as well as the posterior drawer test is done with knees in 90 degrees of flexion and it's really important to relax the hamstrings as seen in this video so here the right knee is normal whereas the left knee i've asked her to contract the hamstrings and you can't appreciate an anterior draw but as soon as she relaxes it an anterior draw test with the anterior translation of the tibia is very obvious and to make sure that you do not get a false positive on the acl 
we always have to check for a posterior sag sign, which is indicative of a PCL injury. The anterior draw test, again, when it's done in external rotation, will indicate an ACL injury along with posterior medial corner injury. And if this is done in internal rotation and you have a positive anterior draw test, it indicates an additional injury to the lateral structures of the knee. So the pivot shift test is usually best done under anesthesia. So the knee is in extension, you internally to rotate the leg, give a valgus force at the proximal part of the tibia, and then bring the knee from an extension to a flexion position. And roughly about 30 degrees, you feel a pop or a jerk. So the main reason to do this test is to determine whether you're going to do any extra procedure like a lateral extraticular tenodesis or an ALL reconstruction in a very brisk or a pivot test. So other tests for the PCL include the quadriceps active test where you ask the patient to uh, actively contract the quadriceps and the posterior sag is eliminated. The dial test is important to check for posterior lateral corner injuries. You can either do it in a sitting position or even in a prone position, which is preferred. And the aim is to check whether there is any increase in external rotation of more than 10 degrees compared to the contralateral side. And you do it at both 30 degrees as well as 90 degrees. So as seen in this video, so don't hold the foot from the dorsum. It's ideal to hold the foot on the sole. And if there is an increase of more than, 30, more than 10 degrees external rotation only at 30 degrees, it's an isolated PLC injury. However, if it's there at 90 degrees, it's an associated PCL injury as well. So coming to the patellofemoral joint, so a great way to check for a extensive mechanism disruption is a straight leg raise. You can do a patella grind test to pick up other pathology around the PFG. However, for the instability, the apprehension test is quite good in the outpatient basis. However, ensure that you're holding the patella on the lateral aspect with your thumbs or fingers to make sure that they don't have an active subluxation in the outpatient basis. And as seen in the images, the J sign is a good sign to pick up patella maltracking when you come from a flexion to an extension position. The patella glide test, again, giving a lateral stress at the joint, if there's more than 75% glide, that's positive. And you can even check for the MPFL on palpation. So as when it comes to patella subluxation, you not only have to examine the knee, but the hips and the feet as well because we all know that an increased uh, femoral antiversion is a strong independent factor for patella subluxation. So a detailed examination helps us then decide what we need to do for the patient and if we need to do any surgical correction, how to go ahead and do this. So I'd just like to bring upon you know, other conditions that can be present around the knee, such as the ITB syndrome, any bursitis, tendonitis that can give knee pain. And it's always good practice to examine the opposite knee, examine the hips, and in certain cases, examine the spine and the ankle as well. So to have a carefree or hakuna matata in your life and in your outpatient, uh, this is what the wise Rafiki says in Lion King, where you say, so look beyond what is there obviously in front of you and you'll rarely go wrong so in conclusion uh, listen to the patient perform a thorough clinical examination and over time adopt your own order of examination and you'll rarely go wrong thank you thank you thank you pratima i think uh, that was a fantastic talk and uh, it's very difficult to bring about a uh, you know, talk on clinical exam in about 10 minutes, but uh, I think you've given good justice to it. We'll have a lot of questions coming up as well. Uh, what we're going to do now is that I'm going to ask uh, Anupama Patil to come on next. So, you know, for orthopedics, it's pretty critical that we have, um, uh, we should have a good radiologist as your friend and uh, pun intended, Anupama and myself have been um, sort of, you know, friends since our 11th standard. And she still manages to teach a lot to me. Uh, so uh, it's nice, Anupama, that you found time and uh, you're on this uh, webinar. And then you have to demystify the black and white and look through 50 shades of gray and let us know what you know the MRS can say. So Anupama, the screen is all yours to share for the next 10 minutes. Uh, please unmute yourself. Thank you so much.
Perfect. All right. Good evening, everybody. Sachin, if you think 10 minutes is less for physical examination, 10 minutes is really less for radiology. But I've tried to include whatever I can. Okay. So the technique, I think, to good imaging is to have So the technique is what is important for any kind of good MR imaging. And once you have good images, then anybody with an even average knowledge of anatomy should be able to understand MR images fairly accurately. Okay. So the images that you see here are all acquired on a three Tesla unit with a dedicated knee coil. We take images in multiple planes, definitely in three planes, the axial, coronal, and sagittal. We also acquire a 3D data, which we tend to reconstruct as and when we require. And to that, we add, of course, the patellar instability protocol, cartilage imaging, you know, functional testing as and when required. Okay, so since Neha told me to make this black, white, and gray, the things that are black, fortunately for us, most things are black on MR on all pulse sequences. So tendons, ligaments, menisci, and the cortex, they are black on all pulse sequences, okay? So any signal in any of these structures means we're looking at some pathology. The exception to this is if you have sclerosis, fibrosis, and hemosiderin, these things also tend to be black, but we will come to that later. Just two things which are gray. One is the articular cartilage, and the other is red marrow, as you see in this image here. Hang on, let me get the pointer. Yes. So this kind of gray is red marrow. And the things that are white are anything with fluid and anything with fat. So all your fat pads and fatty marrow will be white. Now, the good thing for us is most pathology is white. So degeneration, edema, injury, all of these things will appear white. And I'll show you some examples of all of these. So I'm going to spend some time on the ACL. Now, I did say that the ACL is black. But if you look at this ACL, this part of the ACL, that is the inferior part of the posterolateral bundle, tends to be a little bright and very often is misinterpreted as either edema or strain or some such. It is nothing but synovial fluid that is going in between the ACL fibers, and that's what gives it this image. If you look at the same thing on a T2 sequence, which is taken in an oblique format, you will see that that bright signal tends to disappear, which means that it is a normal ACL. As opposed to that, an acute ACL tear will present like this. Now, when you image very soon after injury, this is what you're going to see. So I would suggest that everyone waits at least about six to eight weeks before you image, because otherwise this is all you'll see. And then it's very difficult to make out if there's any intact tissue in this. This is probably the commonest way that ACL tears present. They come off the femoral attachment. Often they buckle anteriorly into the intercondylar knot, and then these guys come with a locked knee. In children, what happens is because ligaments are stronger than the bone, very typically you get a tibial avulsion. So a tibial avulsion of the attachment of the ACL. So what, what we do at the center that I practice at is we routinely take these oblique images through the ACL because we want to eliminate any kind of artifactual signals that we get. So what I do is I take an oblique coronal, oblique to the plane of the ACL, and then I can get images like this, which beautifully show me the anteromedial as well as the posterolateral bundle. We also take oblique sagittal images. So on a coronal image, I'll take these sagittal images going through the ACL, and then I get an image like this, and then it, you can see that it's so easy to pick up an injury if it happens out there. Okay, so this was a young doctor who came to us with a history of injury about a year back. And if you look at this ACL, it doesn't quite look right, okay? There is some signal inside the ACL. It looks a little bit thin. So instead of going, you know, maybe there is some suspicious signal. I don't know what's going on. What is good is for you to take these coronal images, which is what we do. And if you notice, the anteromedial bundle seen in this is so beautifully seen. And as we go further back, 
we just don't see any posterolateral bundle. And this is a good way for us to pick up in tears of the posterolateral bundle. This is another patient who had a history of injury about six months back. And if you look at these sagittal images, obviously that ACL is not doing so well. But what exactly is going on is hard to make out on this sagittal image. When we take coronal images, if you look at that ACL, not only is it extremely dark, it's very irregular. And if you see, it's flush with the inner margin of the lateral femoral condyle. And what I have done is I have put a comparative image here of a normal ACL. Look at this ACL and look at this ACL. This is definitely abnormal. And what I do is also rely on the other ancillary signs as this lateral image, which shows that there is an anterior translation of the posterior lateral tibia with respect to the femur. This is what a chronic ACL would look like. So often one has to rely on these secondary signs of ACL failure, such as anterior translation of the posterior lateral tibia or a buckling of the PCL. These just sort of add to whatever we already know. The PCL, on the other hand, doesn't usually tear like the ACL. Very rarely will you get a mid-substance tear as you see on this left-hand side image. What commonly happens is what you see on the right side, which is that you get a thick edematous PCL with some signal inside of it. So the criteria we use is if the AP dimension is greater than seven millimeters, we designate that as abnormal. Also, if you notice where I put the blue arrow, there is a dot-like black structure seen inside the PCL. That is the ligament of Risberg. Now, when it tears, parts of the ligament of Risberg or Humphrey can get insinuated into the PCL. And that is another ancillary or auxiliary sign of a PCL tear. The medial and lateral collateral ligaments are fairly straightforward. They are quite well seen on all MR scans. And injuries thereof are also pretty straightforward. This is an avulsion from the femur. This is an avulsion from the tibia. It's actually a bony avulsion. MCL, similarly, high-grade injury from the femoral attachment and a complete avulsion from the tibial attachment. The important thing to remember here, which I tell actually all radiologists, is that you have to remember that the MCL attaches very low down. And because it attaches low down, sometimes you, it doesn't get included in the field of view. So you have to look for it very, very carefully. Menisci are also black. Important thing to remember here is normal menisci, whether in the sagittal or the coronal, they are triangular in shape, they have sharp edges, they have a pointed apex. So any change in the signal, any change in the shape, any blunting of the margins, any blunting of the edges, all of that is abnormal. This is the commonly used grading system where the grade one is degeneration, signal restricted to the meniscus, not touching the margins of the meniscus. The image here shows a combination of a grade two signal, signal which is going to the capsular margin, which in a young patient is often a tear, and in an older patient is often degeneration. This is a grade three signal where the signal goes down to the articular margin, and any grade three signal is a tear. This is another example of a grade three signal going down to the articular margin. But what I do also at our center is volumetric imaging for the menisci. We take a volume set and I reconstruct it like this in the plane of the meniscus so that you can actually see the medial and the lateral menisci in their axial images. And then all of this information is also possible. So for example, a vertical longitudinal tear, which is usually reported as a grade three signal. But when you take this axial section through this, what I see here now is a proper axial depiction of that longitudinal tear. I can tell its length, I can tell its distance from the posterior margin, that the root is intact, there's no displacement. So all of this information is now available. A ramp lesion is just a peripherally placed longitudinal tear. Now, often these get missed. The way I look for them is you look, look for the edema in the medial tibial condyle. There is no reason for there to be edema in the medial tibial condyle unless the patient has had a contrico injury or the meniscus is injured. Now, I don't see signal inside the meniscus, but I do see a signal here at the capsular margin, and that is a ramp lesion. Bucket handle tears are very straightforward. You look for this central image on the sagittal and just under the PCL, a structure which looks like the PCL, which is the, the handle of the bucket, which has got displaced into the intercondylar notch. 
root tears or special types of radial tears. How do we identify? Now, these are the ones that are most often missed. I don't know how many times people have called to say, you know, you missed a lateral meniscus root tear till we started doing these axial images. Now, on the sagittal, this ghost meniscus sign, though it's so beautifully described in multiple articles, many times is missed by the radiologist because it is so close to the center that sometimes it gets mixed up with the fat and the PCL and everything and you don't. So you have to look for it. You see the anterior horn here, you see nothing in that space posteriorly and that is a tear. When I take a coronal through this, I see a gap here, which is the tear. And on the axial images, of course, it is absolutely beautifully seen. Oops. Sorry. Pardon me for this. I don't know. I've lost that. Nope. Try hitting escape. I've lost my. Uh, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sandeep, what is the way out? Or, uh, uh, just uh, use your uh, uh, arrow keys. No, it's not going ahead. I tried. One second. Huh? Can we restart? I am requesting remote control, ma'am. Please give me access. Huh. Okay, ma'am. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. okay. Uh... You tell me, I'll move the uh, sorry, I'll move the keys. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. So go ahead, go to the next slide, please. Yeah, one second. yeah. yeah. horizontal cleavage tears are pretty simple to identify. They are horizontal tears, they run through the center of the meniscus, they're usually associated with a paramenuscal cyst, as you see in this patient. Okay, finally, cartilage imaging. Now, these kind of images are not possible unless you use a 3T field strength magnet, okay? Also, the best sequence is these proton sequences. The simple reason being that cartilage is gray, fluid is bright, and any abnormality is just very beautifully picked up. Look at these images. Now, these are not possible unless you scan on a 3T MR, where you can actually see the tear going through the cartilage. You can see the chondral defect. This is only possible when you do high field strength imaging. This was a 40 year old gentleman. He was a runner and you can so beautifully see that chondral defect. Now, one thing to remember is no matter what sizes we give you of the chondral defect on MR, the actual size of the defect is always larger because many times the adjacent cartilage is damaged and you don't see it unless you do cartilage mapping. And this is my last slide. The reason I put this in is because this bone marrow edema is something that everyone should look at very carefully. Whenever you see edema in any bone, one thing is that it's acute or early subacute. Second thing is it indicates the pattern of injury. So if you have an ACL tear, you will have a pattern like this, lateral femoral condyle, lateral tibia. If you have patella subluxation, it will be the medial patella facet, lateral femoral condyle. And Third, and probably the most important thing is when you're looking for small injuries, like I showed you the ramp lesion earlier on, or in this instance, there is a thin delamination injury of that cartilage. That is only seen if you're looking for it. And the best way to look for it is to look for the edema under it. You see the edema, you look for the structure on top of it, and usually it is either injured or diseased. Okay, I just, this last slide, I just wanted to add that Oftentimes, we don't get the clinical findings or the prior surgical discharge cards or prior MRI scans, radiographs, et cetera. If those are provided, that's, it always just makes it much easier to look at an MRI scan, especially post-op scans. And finally, black, white, and gray, all structures which are normal are blue. And most 
pathology is white. So I think that is that just sort of simplifies this entire talk. And I'm sorry for the whole glitch in between. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Anu. I think uh, you got the black, white and the glitch, everything sorted out in the same thing. So that's <laughs> pun not intended. So okay. take so, questions after um, uh, Laurie does her talk now. We're just going to go slightly flipping the order. I'm going to get Laurie to come in. So Laurie is, I think everybody knows her in the orthopedic world, in the sports world. She's a very accomplished uh, surgeon herself. And she's a great, uh, you know, she's a great advocate of gender equity. And um, recently I was very fortunate to be with her on one of the IODA, which is the uh, International Organization of uh, Diversity Alliance, Orthopedic uh, Diversity Alliance um, webinars with ISACOS when we spoke about gender equity and which is why I feel that, you know, it's really, it was really nice that she could, you know, be, she could accept our invitation to be on our first uh, Iowa IS. So Laurie, thank you so much. And um, I know it's a bit crazy uh, out there right <laughs> for you right now with all the storm coming in, but um, uh, once you're through with your talk, then we'll take a couple of questions so that, you know, we, you can then move on and then we'll move on with our webinar. So over to you, Laurie. Thank you so much for joining Perfect. and all yours to share. Thank you so much, um, Neha, also for inviting me. And uh, I always love uh, my collaborations with India. Canada actually has a great relationship with India. Our last two Canadian, or COA, or Orthopedic Association presidents were both born in India. So you get me, blonde girl, but uh, I've uh, loved our collaboration such and so, um, and I look forward to many more. So what we'll talk about quickly, I'm going to just set my timer there so I don't go over, but we just wanted to talk about graft choice for ACL. And this has changed quite a bit in the last few years, and especially in my mind. So to me, this is a very nice talk to rethink things. When I started practice, I did all hamstring ACLs. I trained in a place with hamstring ACLs. I did fellowship in a place with hamstring ACLs. And most of my practice was like 95% hamstrings. And it's largely because I really don't like harvesting a patellar tendon. But now with the um, quads tendon making a big resurgence or surgence, um, I think it, we've rethought how we think about graphs for ACL. So I'd just like to go through the thought process on how you might think about how you pick a graft for a patient, because there are some strong opinions out there. And I think if we go back to just how we approach things, that helps us navigate um, this issue. So really, what, what do we want out of a graft? Well, for the perfect allograft, we'd have, you know, great histology that mimics the native ACL. We'd have perfect biomechanics. It would be predictable. It'd be a good size. You could use it for all your patients. So you only had to know how to do one kind. Um, it would work great and it would be fast and easy. So again, nothing is ever perfect, but these are the things we look at when we're thinking about a graft. So these are our options and they're well known to everybody. We'll talk a little bit about the three autographs, a quick on the allograft and just a titch on the anterolateral ligament, um, just because it is, it does change perhaps what graft we might use. So if you look at surgeons around the world, they have strong preferences, which probably surprises nobody because they're surgeons. But if you look at the ACL study group, which is global, these are uh, the graphs they use for primary ACL. Half the surgeons that were surveyed in the ACL study group used hamstring, 30% patellar tendon, and then a smattering of others. So you can see around the world, it's uh, hamstring actually dominates at least a couple of years ago. When you look at America, uh, you can see that this is AOSSM and American Academy responders. And when they looked at high school or college athletes, they used largely the patellar tendon and much less the hamstring. Um, and then when you look at NFL football players, so these are high risk young people, again, a large preponderance of patellar tendon. So Americans definitely seem to prefer the patellar tendon graft. Um, and this is the moon knee group. Again, a bunch of knee surgeons, you've seen the studies from them. Uh, and again, Americans seem to prefer the patellar tendon. Well, if we go to Scandinavia and they have all the registry data, you can see here the red is hamstring tendons and in Scandinavian Europe, and I would argue in Canada follows Europe a little more closely, seem to prefer the hamstring graph. So all these strong preferences and how do we sort through that for what we wanna do for our patients? 
Well, honestly, if you boil it down, probably graph choice is six of one and half dozen of the other. And this is an English saying, you, you probably know it, but you can, there's two different ways to describe things and you might think of it one way or the other, but really they're the same thing. And I always tell my patients, it's far more important where I put my tunnels than what graft we're going to choose. So when we're choosing a graft, just remember we're nitpicking little things to try to make our surgery better for that patient. These are not huge um, do or die decisions, at least in my mind, and that's how I think about it. So looking at those qualities we thought of a good graft, we have to look at is the graft strong enough? So you, I think I gotta start, yeah. So here's our native ACL. So if we look at load, if we look at stiffness, if we look at area, um, that's what we're trying to mimic. So if we're trying to mimic our native ACL, and you can almost argue that because maybe their native ACL wasn't so hot because it tore, yeah? So anyways, if you look at quadriceps tendon, patellar tendon, and quadrupled hamstring tendon, you can see they're all strong enough. Um, their stiffnesses vary, and I'm not sure we know what the ramifications of that are. And then if you look at cross-sectional area, you can see why the quadriceps people love to... Um, raw, raw, the quadriceps tendon, because it's bigger than a patellar tendon. And really people who say the hamstring tendon is not big enough, you can see that a quadrupled hamstring tendon actually is bigger than your native ACL. So again, if we're looking at strength, they're all strong enough. Six of one, half dozen of the other. What about ease of harvest? Well, I think there's some arguing for this. I find hamstring tendons very easy to harvest because I've harvested 10,000 of them. Um, but I think most people would argue that hamstring and quadriceps, once you're through the learning curve, are actually fairly reasonably easy to harvest. Patellar tendon has a lot more difficulty in harvesting, and it's probably why I hate the patellar tendon. Um, and of course, allografts are easy because you can just open the package. What about its healing? We also need that tendon to heal and become a ligament so that we can send our patients back to sport. But if you look at the healing properties and the ligamentization of the ACL, all of these graft choices tend to be fairly similar, except perhaps that allograft. So again, when you're choosing um, the healing properties and return to sport, you still have to wait that time for the ligament to get strong enough for all of your graft choices. And this is what your patients care about. How quick can I go back to sport? Well, because of those biology reasons, probably all of them get back to sport uh, when you let them, hopefully. But that time length is not grossly faster for any graft. The only thing hamstring might have the advantage for it tends to be a less painful graft. So if functional return is walking around, going to work, um, going to the grocery store and just doing your activities of daily living, the hamstrings definitely are less sore post-operatively for a few weeks. What about clinical outcomes? Well, you can probably go down the rabbit hole on PubMed of all the studies that have been done look, comparing graft choices and how patients do. But we know there's lots of reasons why patients do well or not well. And if you really go down and look at all the studies, probably it's safe to say that we've been unable to firmly demonstrate that there's a difference in patient reported outcomes or time to a safe return to play for any of those graph choices. So again, six of one, half dozen of the other. There's some suggestion in the study that patellar tendon grafts and probably quads might have um, a little smaller incidence of residual laxity pivot shift. Um, and then the only uh, place where uh, there has been a good demonstrated difference in the grafts is with re-rupture rate. And again, we'll talk about how we choose our patients, but the patellar tendon graft does has been demonstrated to have a lower re-rupture rate, but you can see the numbers 2.8 versus 2.84 doesn't sound like much of a difference, but it does reach statistical significance. But if you actually look at the number needed to treat, NNT number needed to treat, so to actually see that difference, you would have to do 235 ACL reconstructions to prevent one re-rupture. So again, these are small differences. And again, using our patient characteristics to choose what graft, that's not a huge difference in rupture rate, re-rupture rate. And then when you look at graft harvest, there's definitely some more morbidity associated with the patellar tendon as well as the quadriceps tendon, perhaps. 
So where does that leave us? Well, well, let's make it all easy and not harvest anything and just use an allograft. That might be fine for our older patients, but most of the studies have shown us that we should not be using an allograft in our young athletes. So the moon group was the main um, group that showed this a very much higher re-rupture rate in young patients, especially in high-risk pivoting sport with allograft versus autograft. And I can tell you now, I don't even offer an allograft to my patients under 25, unless it's a really extraordinary circumstance. Um, so those are those studies that show that. Um, also for revision, allograft's a great uh, thing to think of when you've already harvested something. But again, the data from the moon group is showing that there's quite high re-rupture re rates for allograft in young athletes. So when can we use allograft? Really that older patient. So if you look at the graph of the re-rupture graph of the re-rupture rate, um, when they hit about 35 to 40, that re-rupture rate equals out. So again, for my patients over 35, uh, unless they do high-risk pivoting sports, I'll be more likely to offer an allograft. And they do very well in those older patients. And I really hate saying that 35 or 40 is older, but I would get an allograft. There you go. So how do we choose then? So if all those graphs are not that different, how do we choose? Well, if we look at a 40-year-old recreational athlete, probably don't need to do the patellar tendon with the increased morbidity. We can use one of the other graphs. The 17 year old female soccer athlete, however, in my hands, they're getting a quadriceps tendon. Some most many people would do a, a patellar tendon also. So really that patellar tendon quadriceps gold standard for collision and uh, young athletes, but we still have room to improve. And one of the things that has been interesting is the addition of an LET or an ALL. And the stability data we can talk about, but that has shown perhaps you can do an LET with the hamstring and that brings it up to the re-rupture rate of a quadriceps or a patellar tendon graft. So that um, data shows that that re-rupture rate and uh, residual laxity is less if you add the LET to a hamstring. So maybe it's not just about graft. So thank you very much. Thank you, Laurie. I think uh, that was indeed a very nice overview of uh, you know graph choice. And uh, before you run away, I think um, we have time for a few questions. And um, I have a lot of questions that have come up here. So, Laurie, first thing is that uh, you know what? How would you modify your graph choice if you have this um, sort of female patient with an ACL tear who is about twenty-four years old, plays um, recreational sport and has got hyperlaxity? with hyperextension of almost about 15 degrees. So does that modify your graph choice in any way? And if so, how? Yeah, so all those young patients, so pretty much under 25 right now are getting a quadriceps tendon from me. So as I said, I was I, I was really hesitant. I hate, I hate doing bone patellar bone, quite honestly. Um, but when the quadriceps started, I started doing them and they work great and they just don't have that harv harvest morbidity. I use it all soft tissue, so I don't have all the struggle of passing that bone black block, which drives me crazy. So I pretty much offer a quadriceps tendon um, in all those patients under 25. The hyperlaxity is really important because that's definitely been shown in our stability study to increase uh, the, the risk of residual laxity. And you might even consider adding an LET to your quads graft if they're very high risk and have uh, hyperlaxity. Yeah, I think there's another question um, uh, which uh, Pratima can answer is that, you know, if you're looking at um, someone who's got an ACL tear, which would you think is the most sensitive test that you'd want to do? So if there's one test that you want to pick, which test would you pick in the acute situation and which test would you pick in a chronic or a subacute situation after about a month or so when the knee is not so painful? Thank you. I think Dr. Laurie has already answered this. Uh, you know, definitely in the acute setting, it would be the Lapman test. That would be our go-to test, and it's the most sensitive. So even one month down the line, the Lapman is still a very sensitive test to pick up, and you don't necessarily need to do a pivot shift test in the outpatient setting. That's what I feel. Uh, but I mean, I, I definitely would put the question back to say, you know, how many of you actually do a pivot shift in an uh, outpatient basis? I mean, uh, you're asking in the acute setting? 
no no in in a, in a say a month down the line two months down the line i think always probably we would always want to test the pivot shift and um, though the reproducibility of a pivot shift done under anesthesia and uh, in the outpatient setting would be a lot different but i think mm-hmm. it definitely is probably the most important test to do along with your latchment test you would agree lori or you have any yeah. difference yeah. Yeah. If they, I mean, if their knee is sore and swollen, then you're not going to have a very valid pivot. So I you often don't do it then. But if they're they have a quiet knee, I I always do it. Yeah. Right. So, so uh, I just had a question for Dr. Lori, if that's yeah, okay. Go ahead. Sure. So uh, Dr. Lori, have you stopped completely doing hamstrings graft? And do you also have any experience with the peroneus uh, graft? Uh, so I would say my hamstring is still my go-to graft, and then uh, I change it to a quadriceps in that setting of the young patient, high-risk pivoting athlete. Um, and then in my over 40s, I'll throw hamstring or allograft. We get free allograft, so that's not an issue for me. So um, I will offer that, especially um, to my not-so-pivoting athletes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then perineus, we use a lot of perineus uh, allograft. But I am, yeah. yeah. They're often small though. You have to triple them. Yeah. Neha, yeah. question. I, yeah. I just wanted to ask, uh, what was your experience about BTB? Uh, oh. attending? And wh- what <laughs> problems did you face? I mean, mm-hmm. why you shifted to quadriceps? <laughs> that, that's me having a strong opinion, yeah? <laughs> so, um I'm a patella surgeon primarily, so uh, chopping out pieces of patella really hurts my heart. (laughs) Um, I also, where I trained, we just didn't do many. So part of it is my um, inexperience with that graft. Um, I do do some now um, as part of the stability study and I've done them because I I felt I should, but um, it's a lot of it is just everywhere I trained, we did all hamstrings. And so I'm very comfortable with a hamstring. Um, but I really don't like um, messing with the patella. And I just find that struggle with uh, passing that bone block and putting the screw in is always a struggle. And it just makes the operation so much harder. Um, I, I know people who do patellas probably are much more experienced than don't have the troubles I have, but uh, I, they, they love the patellar tendon graft, those who do it for sure. So some of it is just comfort level and how you were trained. Yeah. Anu, a question, Anu, a quick question for you, which is that you mentioned that, you know, the ideal time to image the ACL would be somewhere around the four to six week mark. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, would you consider that to be the gold standard or if, um, if you would be imaging uh, ACL ruptures early on, say a part of a combined ACL MCL tear, and you have someone who is maybe yeah. three days following the injury, do you find any diagnostic difficulty in imaging the ACL or do you tend to overinterpret the injury per se related to the ACL? So this is where those oblique images come in handy, Sachin, because there's so much of edema that when we take these oblique images, some of the confusion is clarified. Now, I understand that you can't always wait for six weeks. If there is an associated MCL injury, you have to go in an image then. So we we uh, fine-tune our protocol a little bit. If you eliminate the fat saturation from your imaging, then a lot of the extraneous edema goes away. Perfect. So that's, that's what we do, yeah. Laurie, anything different in your clinical practice about imaging? <laughs> yeah, our wait list for MRIs is about six months to a year. So okay. I re- like unless you have a locked knee, we don't get uh, that quick. That was okay. my face I made when you said that. <laughs> Okay, one last question for you, Laurie, before we yep. uh, allow you to run away, uh, only with the promise that you'll be back with us again. So, <laughs> so one last question is, what's your experience being with um, artificial graft and adding artificial graft to an autograft? Yeah, that's a great question. So again, with hamstrings, uh, sometimes they are small. Sometimes you have a student or you yourself chop off a gracilis or they have a very small gracilis. So I have been, uh, since the suture tapes have come out, I've been quite liberally adding a suture tape like an internal brace. Um, I think there's very little harm. The the harm would be is if you tension your internal brace or your suture tape um, tighter than your graft and it, it stress shields it. So I'm just very, very careful that I don't do that. I use it a tensioner, which I think stops me from doing that. So I tie them 
together. Um, but I think that would be your main danger of that. And it seems like a really nice way to strengthen a graph that might be a little subpar. There are some new, um, I don't want to get too company specific, but there are some new things coming out, at least in America, that are more of a synthetic ACL. And I think those have some promise, especially in the acute setting where they're augmenting perhaps a repair. So uh, again, we don't get too many acute ACLs here, so I don't have too much uh, experience with that, but I'm fairly liberal with adding a suture tape type internal brace. Yeah. Excellent. I think uh, that was really nice. And uh, thank you, Laurie, for, uh, you know, sparing about an hour and joining us. And um, we hope, you know, that you would be with us and we would help this um, whole uh, new thing that we've started with the mm -hmm. Iowa coming in. And I speak on behalf of Neha and Pratima and uh, very soon we'd be very happy to have you over in India and, you know, need some very good, um, you know, uh, faculty sessions and uh, delegate sessions for uh, all our wonderful women that we have here who are uh, very wow. eager to take up um, sports as a practice. So thank you, Laurie. And um, thank you so for, much, uh, everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, we'll move on to the next part of the talk in which uh, we're going to have Neha, who's going to be speaking to us about how she's helped set up uh, arthroscopy practice, which um, is something that we'd all want to hear. Over to you, Neha, and please let us know what your thoughts are. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Is it visible? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely visible, yeah. Uh, so good evening, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Indian Arthroscopy Society and our president, Dr. Sachin Tapasvi, sir, for supporting EVA, Indian Women in Arthroscopy, in this venture. I'm Dr. Neha Godgate, working in the central part of India. And today I'll be speaking on how to start up the knee arthroscopy for beginners. So our previous speakers have nicely sailed us through the diagnosis. So it is up to us to decide if the patient needs surgery or not. So knee arthroscopy is commonly needed in cases of meniscus and cruciate stress, then presence of loose body, synovitis and osteochondral defects, etc. So the recent studies from the US and UK have shown that knee arthroscopy is one of the most common orthopedic procedures worldwide. So if your OR is the heart of the hospital, then your instruments are the vessels. So good quality and proper care of the, this ecosystem is needed for better performance. So arthroscopy trolley contains monitor, camera and light source, shaver and RF device, which is a cautery system of the arthroscopy and also a stabilizer to protect your valuable system. So on Mayo trolley, the optics are arranged as camera, scope and light cable then shaver with a shaver blade and suction tube. And lastly, a cannula with a blunt rocker and a probe. So various common types of low profile punches like curved punches, side punches, help to cut the tissues and take punch biopsies, etc. And grasper helps holding the loose bodies. So the studies have uh, shown, stated that uh, up to 5% of all the pyogenic knee arthritis in adults are attributable to arthroscopy. So the most important step is sterilization of these instruments. So ETO and plasma sterilization is available in India and optics like these are sterilized with this process. However, all the metal instruments can be very well be autoclaved. So a sterile disposables like suction cannula, TURP set, drapes are available in market. Now we come to the slide that how we connect these optics. So video camera has a quick coupling mechanism where the arthroscope is inserted in the video camera and then quick coupling mechanism is uh, released and the scope is fixed. After that, the fiber optic light cable is connected. The long press of the white button on the camera will help in white balancing. It is uh, one of the important steps before you start your arthroscopy. 
TURP set is attached to the cannula and other end is attached to the three liters of NS bottle. So it is important to know these concepts in arthroscopy. The angle of inclination is the angle between the axis of the shaft of the scope and perpendicular axis of the lens. So commonly used is arthroscope is 30 degree arthroscopes in knee. Uh, so direction of uh, light cable is exactly opposite to that of the scope lens. So this helps in getting the orientation where the scope is inside the joint. The triangulation is the core competency needed in arthroscopy. The tip of the instrument should be visualized in front of the lighted area and in the video monitor. So this is the triangulation technique which we need to understand or get used to. So to learn these psychomotor skills, currently a plethora of arthroscopic trainers uh, ranging from low fidelity non-anatomical simulation models to high fidelity simulation models such as anatomical virtual reality systems are available. In recent prospective randomized control trials showed that after training residents on simulators, their cadaveric knee asset score increased significantly than the control group. So simulators do help in understanding the triangulation technique. Also, various cadaveric workshops are arranged throughout the year by Indian Arthroscopy Society and they help to gain more skills. So once you're trained enough, it's time for you to operate on your patient independently. So first and the most important step is to confirm the side and then examination under anesthesia is performed to look the actual laxity of the knee, then uh, the patellofemoral laxity, then uh, the range of motion. So if the patient has hyperlaxity or uh, if the patient has uh, any uh, flexion deformity and then anteroposterior laxity and rotatory like instability is also checked pivot shift test is better performed under anesthesia and it is important not to miss the posterior laxity so critical points in positioning include placing the ipsilateral hip at the edge of the table and feet at the end of the table so uh, the tunica is applied as high as possible with adequate padding. Adhesive tape is attached around the edge of the tunica to avoid seepage of scrubbing solution beneath the tunica. And then thigh support is applied lateral to the tunica and foot support is applied in such a way that knees flex to 90 degrees. Arthroscopy trolley is on the contralateral side and meticulous water resistant draping is must in arthroscopy. So after exsanguination and raising the tunica pressure to 300 mm of Hg, patella tibial tuberosity and patella tendon are marked. Then anterolateral portal is a weaving portal and anteromedial portal is a working portal and its position changes a bit according to the pathology. So other accessory portals are superolateral, superomedial, posteromedial and posteriolateral portals located one centimeter above the joint line behind MCL and between LCL and biceps uh, tendon respectively. The transpatella portal is located uh, over the patella tendon one centimeter below distal pole of patella and it is used most of the times to fix ACL avulsion fractures. A proper placement of anterolateral portal just superior to lateral meniscus and just lateral to patella tendon allows optimal visualization of compartments of knee. The soft spot is palpated, then 11 number blade is used to take a stab incision up to the capsule, unlike shoulder joint where only skin is incised. A sharp edge of the blade faces superiorly to avoid iatrogenic injury to the meniscus. So then, uh, with a gradual rotatory movement, the cannula with a blunt trocar is inserted till the intercondylar notch. It is then gradually withdrawn a bit and the knee is then extended. The cannula is now advanced in the suprapatella pouch. The trocar is then withdrawn and arthroscope optic system is inserted in the cannula like this. So this is the first picture you see once you are inside the suprapatella pouch. Then the scope is gradually withdrawn to see both femoral condyles and patella tracking is checked 
by gently flexing the knee. Then the scope is glided in the medial gutter. These are the capsular uh, reflections of the medial gutter. And uh, it is important spot to locate the loose bodies. So after that, uh, we enter the medial compartment of the knee. Then the anteromedial portal is made with the needle by outside in technique. Needle is just superior to the meniscus and care should be taken not to injure the meniscus or the articular cartilage. Then a stab incision is taken and probe is inserted. So uh, the probe is basically the extended finger of the surgeon and middle meniscus can, be well, can well be visualized uh, by giving valgus and external rotation force on the knee. With the help of probe, we can palpate the undersurface of meniscus, also the meniscal capsular junction and sometimes the hidden lesions are diagnosed by probing. Then the knee is gradually flexed to see ACL. The scope moves to intercondylar notch. A novice arthroscopic surgeon would think that ligament mucosum as ACL, but ACL is posterior to it. So here we can see after shaving the mucosum, ACL is very well visualized. Then the arthroscope is advanced in the lateral joint line to examine the lateral meniscus, popliteus hiatus and condyles. The lateral compartment is be better visualized with knee in figure of four position. Then the lateral gutter is examined as it shows popliteus tendon and posterior lateral corner of the knee. Here we can very well visualize the popliteus tendon. So here this we can see the popliteus tendon. So with this, we finish our basic diagnostic uh, round of the knee joint and the pathologies found in arthroscopy will be dealt by Sachin sir and it is already dealt by Laurie ma'am. So thank you. Thank you, Neha. Thank you so much uh, for that excellent presentation. I think, uh, you know, when you have to give presentations about uh, basic techniques, probably they are the most difficult presentations to give. So I'm glad that you took up this very difficult topic and uh, you know gave me the simpler topic to speak about. So I'm very quickly going to uh, speak about the uh, about meniscus repairs, why and how should we save the meniscus? And um, this is this is something that uh, you know we all do practice uh, quite uh, frequently in uh, our practice. And the reason being, is that the menisci will serve many important functions. So the most important of them is absolutely load sharing. The medial meniscus carries about 50% of the load in the medial compartment. The lateral meniscus, more importantly, about 70% of all load. And the menisci are very frequently injured. Almost about uh, you know, 30 to 50% of all ACL injuries will have some form of meniscus tear either in the medial or the lateral compartment. If you, if you perform a meniscectomy, then of course there is increase in the peak contact pressure of the articular cartilage and the amount of meniscus removed is probably the most important predictor for the development of knee osteoarthritis. This study shows that if you start removing more meniscus, then there is a exponential increase in the amount of joint contact stresses, which will then lead to osteoarthritis. Lateral meniscus tears are more important because the lateral side is a convex on convex and which is why it makes it also very important to repair tears on the lateral meniscus. So typically you'd find that you know your tear could either be traumatic which is usually a young athletic um, individual and these are usually associated with ACL tears and are usually peripheral longitudinal tears which, can, which are amenable to repair. On the other hand in elderly people above, uh, you know, beyond their fifth decade, like myself, we will usually land up with a degenerative tear, which is following a trivial twisting injury. And there could be some pre-existing degenerative changes. And these usually are of complex patterns and of horizontal cleavage tear patterns, and they may not be very amenable to repair. But all the same, you should try and save the meniscus, because if you are able to save the meniscus, and if for some reason the meniscus does not heal, then you will end up removing almost about 85% less meniscus than what you would do if you performed a primary meniscectomy. 
And of course, if you have meniscus healing, then you have a concomitant increase in the clinical outcomes, which is pretty important as well. After a meniscus repair, you'd find that you have a better chance of returning to the pre-activity, uh, pre-injury activity level and a lesser risk of getting osteoarthritis at a 10-year follow-up. So what are the important factors to look at when we are considering meniscus healing? So I think we need to understand that the periphery of the meniscus um, gets a rich vascular supply which originates from the synovium and the capsule. And this allows the meniscus to get repaired with a variety of techniques that we will discuss in the next couple of slides. What's also important and very critical to understand is that the fibers of the menisci are placed as circumferential fibers. And hence the suture pattern that we should use should be a vertical suture and not a horizontal suture which will have firm fixation. Most important as what Neha has spoken to us about is that we need to have good visualization. And if we fail to visualize the meniscus properly, we might end up damaging normal structures like good cartilage. So here we have a knee which is a bit tight. It's opening only about two millimeters even with the valgus stress. And once you perform pie crusting of the medial side in the area of the MCL just below the tibia or at the level of the joint line, you can see that you're very effectively able to increase the opening on the medial side to almost about 10 to 12 millimeters. And this allows us to reach the meniscus a lot more carefully. We want to improve the, our healing rates and which is why we perform augmentation by using mechanical techniques like rasping, performing vascular access channels either with a microfracture awl or with a needle. And last but not the least, we make these vents in the intercondylar notch which allow the bone marrow to extrude out and then carry the growth factors along with the same. In tears, which are relatively avascular with to the red-white zone, we would use a fibrin clot, which will act like a chemotactic and a mitogenic stimulus and will allow growth factors to help heal the menisci. So remember, use a non-absorbable suture and always use a vertical mattress pattern. So let's say we are trying to repair a tear on the lateral side and we want to put in sutures at a distance of about four millimeters away from each other. The popliteus is probably the boundary which will bind um, separate the posterior third which receives an all inside technique from the area which is anterior to the popliteal hiatus which can be very easily tackled with an inside out technique. The inside out method utilizes a variety of cannulas. These cannulas can either be straight cannulas which allow you to pass the needle straight or you have zone specific cannulas which are extremely useful which allow us to reach varying areas of the meniscus from the anterior mid to the posterior third area and thereby allow this all in inside out technique to reach to farther areas of the menisci. When we're performing an inside out technique, it's useful to perform a safety incision. These safety incisions on the lateral side will protect your common perineal nerve and we create this space between the lateral head of the gastrocnemius posteriorly and the capsule anteriorly and the common peroneal nerve uh, distally so that our sutures can pass and we can tie our knots on the capsule without risk to the neurovascular bundle. This is how this would look in clinical practice. Similarly, on the medial side, we would perform the same. So here's an example of a large complex meniscus tear which needs to be treated surgically. As you can see, this is a partially discoid type of a tear wherein which we have to first try to reduce the meniscus. So here we are trying to see for reducibility of the tear. You can see that it is coming from a vascular area. And once you've achieved that, you know that yes, this tear can be treated surgically. So then we go ahead, do a trimming of the meniscus to decrease the amount of the discoid portion of the same and then proceed with the repair technique. It's always useful to start at one of the corners of the meniscus. So you either make a central reduction suture like what I'm doing. So I'm coming in with my inside out cannula and I'm trying to reduce the meniscus much like when you're trying to you know, fix a fracture, you hold the key fragments together and then you use a simple K wire or a couple of K wires to just hold the fracture temporarily while you then you know, go ahead with your definitive fixation. The same principle holds true here. 
I usually either pass a suture in the front and in the middle of the meniscus tear, and then I hold the meniscus down, which then enables me to go ahead and repair the meniscus adequately. On the medial side, you can choose a variety of techniques, which is the ins all inside, inside out, and the outside in. And this is an example of a large peripheral longitudinal or a bucket handle tear, which can be demonstrated here. It's in zone zero, zone one, which is the red, red zone. And this is the type of tear that you definitely want to repair in someone who's young and has got good cartilage. So the first procedure here is to then go ahead and do a pie crusting of the medial side. This will allow you to open up the joint and you want to judge the reducibility of the tear and the stability of your reduction. So two important points that you want to definitely keep in mind. Next, you want to use your various methods to augment the healing. Here we are using the rasping of the meniscocapsular junction. You want to abrade even the synovium, and then you go ahead and start passing your sutures. So you can either start from either of the edges, the far posterior or the far um, anterior, what I usually prefer is to go bang in the middle and I pass a first suture, which is a reduction suture, which is a vertical mattress suture, which will hold the meniscus reduced, which will then and make it stable so that I can then go ahead and pass my further sutures. So remember to pass alternating sutures on the top side and on the bottom side of the meniscus. They make it really important and critical because you want to grab and hold, you know, maximum area of the meniscus. So we're using a straight cannula here, uh, which is my preferred cannula for the first uh, suture. And then we go on and um, start passing subsequent sutures, which then will be placed at a distance of about five millimeters away from each other. So in interest of time, I will um, not sort of go in a lot of details, but basically discuss the principles of the same. So once you pass your sutures on the top side, you'll find that the meniscus gets everted and then this allows the undersurface of the meniscus uh, to become amenable for repair. So here we are now passing sutures on the undersurface of the meniscus and this undersurface repair will then help hold the whole meniscus down and reduce it right to its base which then allows us to have a good repair. Once you've repaired the mid zone of the meniscus, you can then turn your attention to the posterior third of the meniscus and repair it with the help of all inside devices. So as you can see very nicely, the moment you pass your undersurface suture, the whole meniscus sort of sits down firmly exactly in the same position where it should be. And then you can go ahead and tie your further knots, which make life a lot more simpler. So a use of a safety incision really sort of, you know, frees up a lot of space and allows you to try and improve your visibility and to get good stability and hold. What about the outside in technique? In the outside in technique, you'll pass two 18 gauge spinal needles or you have specialized instrumentation for the same. You'll pass a suture, which is usually a 2-0 high strength suture through the needle, which is um, away from you or posterior to you. And you will pass a snare through, uh, through the needle, which is anterior to the same. And then it is a matter of just retrieving the suture out of the snare in this particular fashion, and then removing both the needles one by one, and then making sure that the knot and the suture sits firmly on the meniscus. So this is an example of the same, the same patient. You can see that we have the suture in the needle, which is posterior or away from you. You have the snare in the needle, which is towards you. And then once you pass the needle, um, through the snare, all that needs to be done is that you need to retrieve the suture out by using either a small mosquito hemostat or by using a small grasper. And once that's been done, you have to retrieve or uh, both the needles out one by one. You start with the needle with the suture first and then pull the other one out, which will then allow you to have a good bite at the level of the capsule. And then in all that you need to do then is to use your knot tying techniques to tie it down. So the outside in is again a very useful technique which can be used on the medial side, anterior to the MCL and on the lateral side, anterior to the popliteus. Sometimes you end up with these very complex tear patterns. This is a radial tear. Radial tear is probably the most devastating because all the hoop stresses of the meniscus are lost. And when you are uh, dealing with a radial tear, 
it's important that you need to do what is called as a side to side repair. So this is probably one of the indications where you will be doing not a vertical suture, but a horizontal suture because the uh, tear pattern is such that you need to perform a side to side repair. Radial tears should be rehabilitated a lot more slower than uh, peripheral longitudinal tears. Um, you know, essentially they're more unstable than a peripheral longitudinal tear and they do require, you know, placing a large number of sutures often in what is called as the hashtag configuration to allow for firm stability. After you perform a meniscus repair, you need to be very slow and gradual with your range of motion and with your weight bearing as well. You cannot treat them like, uh, you know, just an ACL reconstruction and you do need to brace them for about three to four weeks before you allow them to return to sport and return to activity. So to conclude, you need to understand the prognostic factors to save the meniscus. Uh, depending upon the zone of the tear, you want to definitely pick your winners. You also want to know the length of the tear. If you have uh, you know, long tears, they don't heal well, but if you excise a lot of meniscus, they definitely have a poorer prognosis. If you have a tear which is more chronic, probably that is the tear that you don't want to get to because you could have lost a lot of its healing potential and these are best treated with a meniscectomy. Um, younger the patient and more compliant the patient, better is going to be the outcome of your meniscus healing. And of course, if you have uh, an unstable knee, uh, your meniscus tear is going to fail. So which is why make sure that you have a properly well aligned lower limb and a stable knee before you perform a meniscus repair. So try and save the meniscus as much as possible, especially the lateral meniscus. As a surgeon, you need to be proficient in all various techniques um, that need to be utilized because one tear may need more than one technique and you need to be aware of all the newer devices which can offer a lot more security with consistency and strength. So uh, thank you so very much uh, for uh, asking me to be on this uh, webinar. I think it was a great experience. Uh, Sandeep, if you have any questions, uh, please do come ahead with the same. Um, any questions for any of the speakers, Neha and uh, Pratima and Anupama, myself, and if uh, and then we'll go to concluding remarks. I have a question for you, sir. Yeah. Yes, Neha, please. Yeah. So, uh, what are your tips for posterior horn of lateral meniscus? How to save that? I mean, uh, because of vascularity, many are, are afraid. So I think uh, yeah, one of the important things is that the most of the all inside meniscus repair systems will have a depth probe, which is a part of the instrumentation. So utilize the depth probe and measure the distance of the menisco capsular junction from the tear. MR studies have shown that the neurovascular bundle is at an approximate distance of anywhere between 6 to 10 millimeters away from the menisco capsular junction. So if you adjust the length of your all inside device on the same, it allows for a lot of safety. There is some concern that if you pass your all inside device through an anterolateral portal, you know, you are more likely to pierce and injure it. So you can pass the same through an anteromedial portal and then your trajectory will ensure that you are not hitting the neurovascular bundle straight away. Okay. Thank you. I actually had a question. So this is one of my patients. I'm just trying to draw it because I don't know how to describe this. Yes, so she was a 28 year old with an ACL injury, chronic ACL, and this was her lateral meniscus. So she had two longitudinal tears with a small radial tear. So we were able to, you know, just punch the radial tear and remove this part. But how could we have best dealt with these two longitudinal tears? Because if it's the first time that, you know, we've come across something like that. Yeah. So was this tear in the area of the popliteal hiatus or was it uh, way far posterior to the popliteal hiatus? No, so in the area. So it was uh, one of the tears was posterior and anterior to it. And one was just posterior to it. Right. So I think, uh, you know, looking at the diagram, probably what I would have done is that I would have used an all inside device uh, posterior to the popliteal hiatus and okay. inside out device, uh, inside that type of suture, or now we have the flexible all inside devices anterior mm -hmm. to the popliteal hiatus. So that would have stabilized the meniscus tear posteriorly and anteriorly at both places. And now mm -hmm. comes the challenges as how to fix 
both the vertical longitudinal tears which are there. So in this, an all inside suturing device um, like the Novo Stitch Probe comes very handy. And mm -hmm. I think um, last week only I did one of those. So I'll definitely pull out that video and I'll send it to you, Pratima. You can have a look at that. It, um, it makes life a lot more simpler. If you have, uh, you know, the facility to do an completely all inside repair with sutures, uh, taking mm -hmm. one bite in the far periphery and one bite um, in the area of the meniscus, which is closer to you, then so you, can, yeah, that's include correct. both of it. So you go one completely behind and one here and include both together. That's it. That's trying correct. to suture this tissue in between and then to the back. That's correct. Um, on that same tear, Anupama, how would you see her MR scan to be? You know, I mean, uh, she's describing a very interesting tear pattern. Do you think an MR scan can, you know, show us that kind of tear configuration beforehand so that you can be mentally prepared because not everyone will have access to all the meniscus repair instrumentation in their operating room. So do you think so that would become possible to do on uh, preoperatively? I think that is one of the reasons to do a preoperative MRI. Not only will it show you the location, the longitudinal extent, its distance from the periphery, these things, remarkably accurately you can make out. You could. Also, it's distance from the popliteal hiatus and so on. So I think if, um, without uh, being biased to an industry, if there is something that you should always have in your operating room, is that you should always have zone-specific cannulas, which can be autoclaved and reused. You should have a bunch of um, inside-out sutures. You should have at least three, four of these all-inside devices. And you have this other um, all-inside suturing device, um, which is available through um, uh, one industry, which, uh, which is one piece of tool that can repair almost all the different uh, tear patterns. And then it can really bail you out in these difficult situations. And uh, you know it can stay inside your OR, neatly tucked away in one corner. And every now and then, you just need that, and that saves your day. So I think uh, you know try and keep all of these in your OR. Uh, it will make your life a lot more simpler. Thank you. Sandeep, any questions that need to be answered? Uh, are we good? No, sir. I think we have answered all the questions available. A very quick question for Neha before um, you know you give the final concluding remarks. Uh, Neha, the question for you is that many a times, um, you know, uh, yesterday I was giving a talk where they wanted me to speak about um, wounded and learned. They wanted me to describe my journey in arthroscopy. And, uh, you know, I went through phases of um, having uh, or dealing with stress, especially with, uh, you know, sterilizing instruments. So when I started off, everything was formalin chambers. And then uh, everybody was using formalin chambers. And then I'd just come back from my fellowship training. So I used to, I remember carrying a can of Cydex in my car along with, a, um, uh, you know, that Cydex autoclaving tray and taking it all over the place and uh, making sure that everything stayed in there for about 30 minutes before I used it. And then of course came ETO and now we have plasma. So, uh, you know, what is it that you would recommend for people who need to be on the move? What sterilization technique will you advise them so that they don't land up with iatrogenic problems of infection because of uh, you know the use of probably suboptimal sterile instruments? Uh, so definitely that is for a freelancer and with lots of cases lined up in a day, it's a big problem for a, a surgeon. However, I would still recommend uh, an ETO instrument if they have one more set so they can have uh, at least two cases lined up and they can use that. But definitely, if at all, uh, I wouldn't opt for suboptimal sterilization like uh, just cleaning up with stellium or um, maybe uh, Cydex is a good option. But still, I would be skeptical to uh, use that. Okay, Sandeep, any comments? Uh, any uh, comments or any closing words? And um, after you finished uh, thanking everyone, um, I, sir, want... I think you have a question, sir, from uh, Dr. RK. Is there any impact of uh, suture abrasion on cartilage after meniscus repair? So, if you see all these knots, if you tie knots inside the joint and they're slightly prominent, you know, after about three to four weeks, you'll find that they get covered with fibrocartilage. 
So unless and until you have a misfired all inside device, which is like a peak device, which is sticking out, that can only abrade the cartilage. Otherwise, your knots, you try and push them off towards the periphery as much as possible. They'll get covered with fibro cartilage and you know they won't really be abrading them as such. Oh, I think we are done with questions. So I would uh, now invite Dr. Sadeep sir to give vote of thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you, Neha. It was a really wonderful webinar uh, by the IVA, uh, the IS Women's Arthroscopist. So uh, excellent uh, talk by Dr. Fatima about the examination of the knee, followed by Anupama gave very good insight about her black and white world, and which is very much important for the arthroscopic as well as orthopedic surgeon. And then uh, Dr. Lori's uh, talk was excellent about all the craft techniques and her experiences with various different crafts. Neha uh, really enlightened with her journey about how to start the new arthroscopy, and I'm sure it will uh, impact and help many other women arthroscopists to take up this branch. And that's a really good uh, talk by Neha. And as usual, uh, I think on the cake was uh, by Dr. Sachin Tapasvi. So he really covered all his aspects of meniscus repair tips and tricks in a uh, very limited time. Thank you very much, sir. And I would like to thank President uh, Indian Arthroscopy Society, Dr. Sachin Tapasvi, Secretary Dr. Sundar Rajan, and all the whole uh, executive council members who were present today, Dr. Makan, Dr. Abhiji, Dr. Sagar, and all others who were busy with their commitment. Thank you very much. And very thanks to all the users who have taken active participation in this webinar, because I'm sure many people will uh, think of taking arthroscopy as a branch, and that's really good initiative. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.